Longbridge, Birmingham, a rapidly changing community in a regeneration zone typical of many of our cities. Children starting school here will have their learning and development guided by the new Early Years Foundation stage. Against a background of change, will this new vision for learning adequately equip children for their future? And can it succeed in providing, as intended, a sense of self and a positive disposition to learn? With Rover, that was a great impact, really, on the, the children we have, the stability we had with the parents. There's a lot of uncertainty with what children are going to do when they're older and what aspirations they have. I think in a fast-changing language, the EYFS will support and challenge not just the staff, but the children that we have in our school too. The school is the school that I actually attended myself. The community was a very strong one. It was very much based on the Longbridge Works, which was very much part and parcel of our home lives. The one thing we know about our work in the early years now is that we are working hard to prepare children for what is going to be inevitably an uncertain future. In order to deal with that uncertain future, what they're going to need is a sense of self, a capacity to self-manage, to be creative, to problem-solve, to work individually but also collectively as part of a group. The challenge of the new EYFS is not what children should learn. There are relatively few changes here, but in the vision of how they should learn. We do, in the document, see a profound raising of the profile as play as the most powerful vehicle for children's learning. We know that children, when they're in play, are likely to be performing at the edge of their capabilities. They're likely to be developing their imaginative or higher order thinking skills. They're likely to be learning the repertoire of self-management, self-direction, responsibility, to be more creative. I think when children are happy and secure in, a, in an area or in an environment, they are happy to think outside the box. And I think with learning development, the fact that we do trust them, we can do a little bit more with them or let them have that free choice or that experimental time. The new EYFS states that planning should involve all children. Now we're going to think about living things and think about what we could have as a role play area. So what could our role play be? At the start of term, reception is engrossed in negotiating the detail for the new role play area they've mind mapped from their own ideas. The zoo. So what's our new role play going to be? Zoo. It's going to be the zoo. Now it's the tricky bit. We've got to think about what we can have in our zoo. Dinosaurs. Anything. Mm. Children's involvement is at the heart of what we do at Albert Bradbury. It's their school, it's their classroom, it's their role play area, it's their resources. What do you think we need to go and find to make our zoo role play? Sharks. Sharks. Sometimes you might have a big aquarium with sharks in. Yeah. Giraffes. Yes. Yeah, from America. Crocodile. Crocodile. We're getting very brave. Clay. Bottles. What for? What are the bottles for? To drink. To drink. Some baby animals need to have a bottle of milk, don't they, oh, like yeah. babies do? Whenever we introduce a new role play area, we initially start off doing the mind mapping and all of that process. It introduces social skills, taking turns, um, sharing ideas, negotiating. I think that's very, very important for children to learn that at a very early age. They can cope with it. They are able to do it if they're encouraged to, and it's modelled for them. Wow. Then you can stick. Okay. We'll paint the head. We'll paint the head. Okay. What colour? Black. Okay. If they have a role play area that they've made themselves, they'll look after it, they will add well, bits to it, they'll change it. We've got our heads, we've got our body. What else does a zebra need? 
Children's play and exploration is at the heart of effective practice in the EYFS framework. So stories are themed and the children tuned in for their own active learning. Once he is safely back in his cage, she manages to round up Hickory and Dickory. If you just plonk a role player in the middle of the room, expect children to know what to do, you often find fighting, you find that children aren't looking after it, they're not playing with it, not accessing it appropriately. So we always model it now for them. Oh. It works quite well. The children then know what to do. They have an idea of a starting point, so they know what's expected of them when they go in there, and then they know how to further it. Looking forward to seeing you later. Bye. Good morning, Hello. Can I help you? I've come to look around the zoo today. Oh, brilliant. Can I ask how many of you are coming today? It's just me. So it's one grown up. That's a pound, please. A pound. Okay. Um... We've got animal feeding going on throughout the day. Uh, we've got at the Penguin Park feeding at 12 o'clock. And then we've got the gorillas being fed at half past two. Okay. And that'll be very good to go to see if you have a chance. I'd be fed bananas today. Bananas. One of the things that I think we've got to be aware of when we talk about play, we're not talking about an unstructured experience. There's all kinds of things that structure that experience. The way you set out your provision, the way you resource an area, the way you provide stimulation into it, all of that frames and shapes and directs that activity. And a lot of that thinking will have gone on before the play starts because you've created a learning environment that enables the play to happen. I think when children are fully involved, they learn such a lot more. When children are being given a worksheet or an activity that actually doesn't engage them, doesn't enthuse them, they're learning to be part of a team, they're learning that cooperation, they're learning negotiation, they're learning that learning is fun and learning isn't about sitting around a table. Learning can be hands-on and learning can be part of using all of their ideas. The lines. Yep, just got... Then the bats, then the crocodiles, then the shark, then the spider. So where does it hurt? Yeah. Where? Here. 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 Where did it hurt? Okay. Does it? Does anyone hurt it? Is anyone calling? Does anyone hurt it? Where did it yes. hurt? Yes. Where did it hurt? Really, really sore. Let's make it better. Rawr! Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Yeah, it's okay, darling. Keep going. Thank you. Experiences like the role play support several aspects of learning at the same time. Children are interacting, reading and writing, and gaining knowledge and understanding of the world. There's a very very important reason why in the new foundation stage we have six areas of learning that have all been given equal status and that's because these very young children are learning what this world's about. If we narrow down learning experiences to one area or a couple of areas you are narrowing down children's ability to understand how the world works and how they are going to operate within that world. The one thing I would really argue though, there is a very real reason why personal social and emotional development is number one. And that's because there is very clear long-term evidence that children that go through these early years of life and have their personal social emotional learning and development really well supported and catered for are going to go through the whole rest of their lives at an advantage. In the same class, a small group initiated an alternative role play, the swamp. We believe in flexibility, and today there was a little boy and he wanted to make it wet. It's not here. Water. He wrote it, he wanted muddy water, and he came to show me. So then we decided to go and get some water. And he poured the water in and he made a big mess, but he loved every minute of it. How does it feel? So the learning then developed even further, uh, and the, the language was coming out that they weren't using before because the mud was dry. The child-initiated play at Albert Bradbeer has been the starting point for the great majority of their assessment. 
Observation is giving the practitioners an accurate and in-depth view of each child's development. I love sitting back and watching a role play area. I love how it's watching how it develops and actually how it changes from my expectations and what I think is going to go on in there. Children learn and adapt, and I just I just love it. I just love sitting back and just saying, "Wow, how brilliant is that? They're they're doing that. They're sharing. They're talking about things that even I don't expect them to know." At the heart of good practice is a real in-depth knowledge of how the children are responding when they're in your environment and you're only going to know that if you're observing that child regularly on an ongoing basis. So the starting place for planning is observation and observation should be part of your regular practice. It's about really helping the child make that next step that's going to help them fly. So can the new Early Years Foundation stage succeed for all children? And is it likely to be welcomed in all settings? I've always agreed with having some sort of EYFS that was, it was sort of child initiated and with the child ethos at heart. And it allows us to be free, it allows children to have a voice, it allows it to be child centred. I think for some settings, the document does profoundly challenge some of the practice that they may be used to operating under. It's going to be an act of courage to really have a look at your own practice in relation to what this document's saying. The principles. And to say, are we in tune with this? Or are we operating in a way that fundamentally doesn't fit with this ethos? And I think the moral and ethical obligation on us now is to rise to that challenge and to move beyond providing something that's okay for kids, that's safe for kids, is satisfactory, to something that I'd like to see, which is a world-class service. What's the world going to be like? What skills and competencies are they going to need? These have big ramifications for thinking through the kind of opportunity for deep learning to go ahead. And certainly, the learning that goes on in Albert Bradbeer now is very different from the learning that went on when I was there and absolutely should be.